Welcome to Man360, I'm your host Brian. Today on the program we hear an amazing miracle testimony from Matt Crow, who shares about his recovery from a catastrophic mountain biking accident to finish one of the hardest road bike races in North America, the Triple Bypass. He created a documentary that you'll see clips of during his interview and we'll provide a link to on man360.tv. In our hobby segment, I'll show you some of my watches I've collected and we'll give you some information about different types of watch movements and provide a few websites that I've used to build my collection. We'll talk about backpacks in our outdoor segment with my good friend Aaron Malone. Aaron shares some useful information about choosing the right size backpack depending on the adventure and the size of your torso. Then we'll come back here to the studio for our 360 degree review at the end of the program. I'm glad you're here. Let's get started. Welcome to Man360. After hearing Matt Crow's testimony, it is still amazing to me that he is upright, walking, and able to share about the miracle working power of prayer and determination. Matt shared with me some of the things that God taught him through this ordeal, including some of the fears he had to overcome immediately after the accident and during his rehab. I know that Matt's story is going to bless and encourage you if you're in a place of defeat or ready to give up in life. Here's my interview with Matt Crow. So Matt, thank you for being on Man360. Thank you for having me. And um, you know, when you came into the station, uh, I know we were talking about a documentary that you had put together, you had put together about your story, and Yolanda caught me in the hallway and she said, we have got to have Matt on your program. And I was like, absolutely. Um, and really, you're a walking miracle. I, mean, I, I, am. There, I am. There is no reason why you should be sitting here talking to me on Man360 today. No. It's crazy. So I want you to talk a little bit about the accident mm -hmm. and kind of what happened, a little background on it. And um, yeah, just share a little bit. Sure, I, I was mountain biking just outside of Aspen and I had gone over the handlebars and as I did that, I landed sort of head down, head first and my feet went over uh, uh, my body and, and that's right when I landed and I, I didn't realize at the time, but I had a very catastrophic neck mm. injury, um, about the worst you can have. I was, I was instantly paralyzed um, uh, from the neck down, except for my thumb. My thumb is the only thing that twitched. Uh, and then the recovery from that, uh, you know, just took months after surgery that, that evening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that you mentioned we were actually in the hallway kind of talking about, you know, our conversation today, and you were saying that one of the most traumatic things for you was laying there and your cell phone was going off, I think, as your buddies were trying to contact you, mm -hmm. and you could not move. Like, your brain was trying to tell your body to move, but your body could not move. Yeah, you know, our, our cell phone is such a window to the rest of our world. You can call your wife, you can, mm -hmm. you know, text or Instagram or whatever it is that people do. But that's how we get our in information, Googling something. And to have something right there buzzing in my backpack and hearing it with that response of, oh, just, just reach out and grab it, but you can't. Mm. It's almost this surreal m mind situation where you're just tricking yourself and it, it, it just doesn't seem like it's happening. And it, it, at the end of the day, before the next rider found me at about 10 minutes uh, from that point, 20 minutes total, I, uh, I just wanted it to stop. It was mm -hmm. true torture at that point. In so time. What, what was the reaction of your friends when they finally figured out what had happened? I mean, what were they kind of dealing with? I mean, like they saw a ghost, like they saw a ghost. And for me, it was the same thing when they actually loaded me into the gurney and I'm paralyzed from the neck down, so I can't feel anything, but you're watching somebody move your legs and your body into, mm. into something that you can't feel. It's, it, it's a very bizarre bizarre situation. It, it's funny because this morning um, Yolanda was waking up and she was rubbing her arm and she was saying like I was like why do you keep rubbing your arm and she was like I feel like my hand was going to sleep and I was thinking about like I mean that's like the worst <laughs> thing I can think about with not being able to move or you know like when your arm or your leg goes to sleep or something like that but this was like on steroids basically it was just so crazy. It, well actually in, in, in recovery you're, you're blessed to get that. You're blessed to get that feeling which is what I have in my hands wow. and my feet all the time. Wow really so yeah. even now you still have that. Oh yeah. Yeah, I just sort of tuned The reminder. Out. Yeah. Wow. Which is cool. It's yeah. a really cool thing because in a way, it anytime I move or I feel that, I it, it instantly reflects to me mm. all that I've been given. Wow. And that's such a, a treasure for me and it allows me yeah. to instantly move into gratitude almost the entirety of the day. Right. So then you went through obviously a huge amount of time in recovery mm -hmm. as well. 
Um, so, you know, how did how do you feel like God was involved in that recovery time? I know, you know, uh, <laughs> Jim mentioned about your prayer and your wife praying over you and your just that initial time of you when everything happened, but. Like, talk a little bit about just that that recovery process. You know, the the recovery process was uh, twofold. Num- number one is, I think if I, I I could sum it all up, it was God saying, "I just why don't you just sit back and listen? Why don't you just sit back and listen?" That's for a tough minute? for guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you go from being, you know, I can take on anything to I can't go to the bathroom by myself, I cannot it, yeah. feed myself. It changes your perspective real quick if you allow it to, yeah. um, in, in the right way. Mm-hmm. And, and so, number one is, I think he said, I want you to just sit back and listen. And there's some things I, I want to show you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and from that standpoint, I, I, you know, it's it's had tremendous amount of impact in my life from from that point moving forward. Yeah. Um, and from the rehab is just very, very hard because there's a lot of things that they can't do for you. They can mm. say, look, we want you to find your arm or your legs, but we can't help you. We can stimulate wow. it, we can do these things, but there's nothing that we can do. And so to be able to get those back, you sort of ha- are walking that path on your own and with God. Yeah. And um, and that's the only way you get it back. Yeah, yeah. So I know that after you went through everything and you were recovered, um, you were on that further road to recovery, that the triple bypass race is a huge, ridiculous race. I call it a ridiculous race in <laughs> yeah, Colorado. Yeah. Um, so what do, what do you feel like your motivation was for wanting to do that race? You know, it was, uh, uh, I think And what it, is it first, actually, you've described that I, I think I think, it, I think from the very beginning, people, and I would have thought I was crazy, but at the end of the day, there was a voice inside my head telling me that I needed to do it. And I'm convinced that it, it was God talking. And, yeah. And saying to do, well, why would God want you to do a race? Like, what what's the point in that? Because we're guys. Right, because we're guys. He wants me to <laughs> win a race and it wasn't about winning trust me it but it was about completing it and um mm. and i think it was to demonstrate him mm. his power and mm. what he's capable of through us and with us that's really good and, and i think at the end of the day that's what it really was all about and and trust me i had a lot of people saying you want to do what and, and they didn't like it i i actually encountered a lot of of uh adversity from really close friends and family mm. on doing it. And I had to just trust and continue to pray. And then I think as people started to see what was really happening with mm-hmm. it, that um, that it really was an amazing, amazing experience and uh, and choice to make. Yeah, and it's so it's three mountains. So what is, the, what is the triple bypass race itself? It's three mountains in over 100 miles? Yeah, 120 miles. 120 um, miles. Yep. So, so not just 100, it's 120. Mm, correct. So you start <laughs> just outside of Denver and you end up uh, in the town of Avon, which is past Vail, and you go over three uh, 10,000 foot or 11,000 foot peaks. There's actually a hidden one in there. It should be the quadruple. The quadruple. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, and I think on your average rider, it's like eight, nine, uh, 10 hours, something like that. It took me 11 and a half. I call it 12 hours of magic. That's, wow. what, it, that's what it was for me. Well, when I watched the documentary too, we'll provide a link to the documentary on man360.tv. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one of the, ma- the, towards the end of the race, I know you started cramping up and you were, and you were just kind of like, it looked like it was one of those times where you're like, am I going to finish this? Am I really going to do it? Yeah. And I think I, when I watched that and I saw that part, I really felt like that was really where God was showing you that when you when you do something, you put your mind to it and you put me first and you do those things that I'm going to help you accomplish this in your life in really a true way. So what do you feel like God taught you through all these things that you've been through, the resiliency, you know, the healing, all these other things? Like, what do you feel like God really taught you going through all these things? It, you know, n- n- first and foremost, I think right out of the gate, uh, I, I, I end the film uh, it turns out in this way, and it's what are you really thankful for, mm. and what are you going to do about mm-hmm. it or do with it, and it's it, it goes back to the talents, right? The, the talents, like you've been given one or three or five yeah. talents. Yeah. What are you going to? Are you going to go bury them, or are you going to go do the most that you possibly can with them? Yeah. And that's in all aspects of your life. So I think that was the the, the most Im- important thing that I got right out of the get go. Um, and then if I was to sum up what I've learned since then, and this is just scratching, the, <laughs> this is really just scratching the surface, <laughs> but it's, it's definitely the power of God. He is real. He's capable of, of performing miracles. He's capable of performing miracles, not just physically, but I think the biggest one that I received was internally and in, in my heart and yeah. in my spirit. Yeah. Um, the power of, of prayer. Again, there's, you know, I think when my wife fell to her knees in the compassion room, mm-hmm. there were people who were there and just, they, they believe they witnessed a miracle in her yeah. prayer in and of itself. And yep. I had people all over the world. I had 
somebody at Jesus' tomb with a rosary praying for him. He brought it back and handed me the rosary. Wow, that's you amazing. You know, um, uh, the, the power of the village. We're all in this together and yeah. we're meant to be in relationship. Yep. Uh, I think that uh, we're either weaving the fabric of that relationship or we're cutting it at yep. any one time and we need to be mindful. Mm. And that brings me to the, to the next piece, and that's the, the power of choice. That's probably the original piece that he really gave us. Yeah. And he knew what we were going to do with it. Right. <laughs> right, with that power of choice. <laughs> right. But at the end of the day, that's really, and when I was not able to move on the mountain for 20 minutes, that's probably the first major thing he taught me. He yeah. said, only you have such little control. Let me tell you what you do have control of. Wow. And it's, your, it's our thoughts, you know, holding every thought yeah. captive. Yeah. Um, and, and then lastly, I think it's the trans transformation of the spirit and, and written on our jerseys on the triple bypass. And it's on both sides of the jerseys. Mm -hmm. But it's Romans 5, 3 through 5. And it's so we glory in our sufferings because sufferings lead to perseverance, perseverance to character, and character hope. Mm -hmm. And to me, I, I could give a sermon on That's probably the one <laughs> sermon I could give. But really, when you unpack that, all of us have suffering. It's like a ball and chain. Yeah. And, and what you need to do is not walk around and try and brush it under the rug. But you really need to pick that ball up. Yeah. And when you do that, that's living in perseverance. Yeah. And when you live in perseverance for long enough, it actually shifts your character. Mm. And when your character is shifted to a point, it instills hope for you and for others. That's really and that's good. really, at the end of the day, where we're trying to get to yeah. and why we all need that suffering in order to, in order to move forward as, as uh, Christians or yeah. as people. And as, as men. You as know men, gonna, yeah. So I know we have men that are watching. Maybe they're dealing with some kind of hopeless situation. Maybe they got a doctor's report. You know, maybe it's something financial. Maybe it's something in their family. But could you just pray for them and just really encourage them today just from what you've been through that you can pray those prayers for them? Oh, absolutely. I'd be yeah. happy to, yeah. Dear Lord, just thank you for this time. Thank you for this program and, and for having the, the connection and the, the, the camaraderie with, with other men. And I just really ask that no matter what anybody is going through, that they know that whatever it is, is not bigger than you. Mm. And that there are so, you know, if you take what you've been given as far as those sufferings and they feel like such a burden, they feel like stones that are weighing you down, mm -hmm. to know that to go through and to persevere that eventually that stone becomes something that you can slay the giants of others with, Lord. And so just please let the men know that they can use that uh, mm -hmm. for themselves and for those around them in fellowship in order to become better. Yes. In Jesus' name. Matt, thank you so much for being on the program. Thank you. Appreciate you, appreciate your story. And I know it's gonna do a lot of good for a lot of people. And again, we'll have a, a link to your, um, the actual documentary on our man360.tv website so people can go to it. And I just appreciate you, we're praying for you. Man, me too, appreciate you. Thank, thank you. you. Holy crap, finding God's presence in your pain is more than just a book. It's a look inside a very painful time in my life where I almost lost my eye to a disease that doctors could not find the root cause. It drained us financially, emotionally, physically, and even spiritually. It's also about an awakening of a relationship with God and realizing that even though I didn't want to hold on to Him in my disease, that He was still holding on to me. It's a known fact that at some point in life, we will all go through a painful circumstance that can be difficult to navigate. Who we are and what we believe will be tested. I know that I didn't really understand who I was until I came to the end of myself, and this book is my story of what I went through and also what I learned in the process. HolyCrapBook.com has also been set up as a resource for you to continue the conversation after you read the book. You can also go there for more information about how to order the book. I'm excited about helping people see that they can find the holy in the crap of their lives. I've always loved watches, and as I've gotten older, I actually got into watch collecting. So I can remember when I got my first really nice watch in college. It was a 3000M gold-faced Gucci that I actually just recently gifted to my cousin for Christmas this year. He was shocked and surprised by the gesture, and I knew he would love it, and since I didn't really wear it anymore on a daily basis, I knew it would have much more and many more years of life in his collection. So there are some different and so many different kinds of watches that many new watchmakers on the market for people to choose from. And today I'm gonna to show you a couple of newer brands that I really like and also some classics that you're gonna recognize. So today we'll take a little time and talk about the differences between an automatic and a quartz movement. 
some things to consider if you're thinking about buying a higher end watch besides the initial price and the practical uses of a smartwatch and where to find and buy watches on the internet. So a rule of thumb for myself and collecting anything is if I don't have the money for it, then I don't buy it. A collection infers that you have more than one of something when one would probably do the trick. So especially on things like higher end watches or anything more expensive, um, it's important to have patience and to save money or to trade up towards what you want. So a quartz movement is specifically battery operated. That's essentially what it means. An automatic or self winding means that as you move the watch, it winds automatically. Now there's also a manual watch. I don't have any of those uh, that I've collected that actually uh, you have to actually physically wind the watch and, and wind it up. Sometimes automatics just to keep uh, the, the time a little bit, you have to wind it up a little bit more. Quartz is definitely more economical as far as the cost, but you have a battery that you need to replace about every year to year and a half. Uh, depending on the watch. I have a watch actually that I've just replaced I think eight months ago, but the battery is so tiny in it that you know, it needs another battery. So quartz watches are generally more accurate than an automatic watch because there's a spring inside the automatic watch that's always being wound and unwound. And that's why an automatic watch is a little more uh, of a, I don't wanna say gentle, but it has an ability to break a lot easier than a quartz watch. So automatic watches have a little more maintenance to them. Now, some people say you should use a watch winder. Other people say it's not a big deal. I keep all of my watches that are automatics in a watch winder and actually a little case that I have um, that basically, you know, keeps the watch as if it makes the watch think that you're always wearing it basically for the automatic watches. So the maintenance every five years or so, they say, especially on a, on a higher end watch, I do have an Omega uh, Planet Ocean that needs to be sent in. They say to send it in about every five years. What they do is they redo all the gaskets, they completely disassemble the watch, completely reassemble the watch, and that's actually $550 to do that for Omega right now, and that price you know, continues to go up. So, you know, when you're, again, when you're buying an automatic watch, you have to think about some of the other expenses with it, um, and to think about the service of the watch and even where you live. You know, you may live out in the middle of nowhere, um, and even in Denver here, there's actually only about, I think there's only like two places in town that actually are like an authorized service center for Omegas, I did find um, a company in uh, Boulder, actually, that's north of here, that actually where I can replace the battery for me. They can do um, some of the basic stuff for me as well as far as like the, the, uh, the band, as far as they resize the band when I first bought the watch. So, and also winding and setting the date on higher end watches. You actually should take the watch off when you're winding an automatic watch and hold it flat in your hand because you can actually bend um, and it puts stress on the, on the springs and things inside the watch unless it's flat when you wind it. And then also when you're setting the date, to make sure that the date, the hands of the, uh, the hour and the minute are not between nine, or nine and two, because you can actually bend the date inside the, the wires and the, some of the, um, the springs inside that, that keep the date. You can actually bend those if you don't make sure that your arms are away from between nine and two. So just kind of a little side note there. And then also to be careful of water uh, magnets, you know, obviously our iPads and some of the other computers and things, we have magnets in them. And then also shock, you know, if you're wearing your automatic watch to look cool for everybody and you're out golfing, you actually could destroy your watch. So just letting you know that. Um, so also, I have a smart watch. I have an Apple uh, Series 5 that I, that I got, uh, I think it was before last year. And I really love this watch. Um, some people don't, either they just wear a smart watch and they don't have any other watches, but I like my Apple watch actually. Um, there's Google and Android watches as well. Um, but you can see, I, I just love it. It's great, great screen. I bought the Series 5 because then it's the, the actual screen stays on all the time. And I have some of the things too that are turned off on it. So actually I get really good battery life with my Apple Watch as well. And actually I have all these bands too, so I can always switch them out. So I actually have an ability for this watch to look seven different ways just from my bands that I have as well. So for use for my Apple Watch, I use it for meetings. Um, if I have a lot of meetings during a day, I'll wear my Apple Watch because then I can actually, you know, if I get it, um, I'm not always on my phone, which is super rude with people as well. Um, you know, if you're in a meeting or whatever, you don't want to always be on your phone, you can have your Apple Watch with you as well. And then also to adjust it with um, when I'm running or I do uh, my mountain biking too. I have my mountain bike right here. Um, and actually when I have my mountain bike and I always have, if I have one earbud and I'm listening to music, I can adjust the music. I can do all those things on my watch as well. And then also the Apple Watch has what's called fall detection. So what that is, is if it, I have a hard fall, it detects that you've had a hard fall, that actually the watch will respond to you and say, hey, you've had a hard fall. Do you need uh, to, for us to call 911? If you don't respond and you don't move for a certain amount of time, then the watch will actually automatically call 911. It's a setting you can set in the Apple Watch, which is awesome. I just read an article the other day in, on Facebook from a friend that had a fr another friend that fell 
and actually the watch called their emergency contact in the phone and they called the, um, the crew to come get him and they got him off, they actually had a mountain bike accident. And so that was really, again, some more practical uses for the Apple Watch itself. So, so again, these are my watches. Um, these Flex watches are awesome. You can actually remove these. This is Yolanda actually got me this for our anniversary this year. And um, I, I really love it. And it's so funny because this watch is only like $25. So it's not like you have to spend a ton of money for watches. Um, and the good thing about these watches as well is that you can take the strap off of the actual, um, you know, the timekeeping piece here and you can swap them with any of these bands. So I can put this inside of any one of these bands as well. And um, again, and all of these have like a specific thing that they always give back to. So Flex is really cool with like, they have clean water, they have autism that they give back to. I think this one is either like, I don't know if it's specifically like Wounded Warriors, but it's something with the military as well. So they give money back to them. If you purchase a watch, they give money back. Um, these are some of my, of my other quartz watches that I have. These are just some fun ones. This is a really fun one that's from ThinkGeek that actually the outside line is the minute and the inside line is the hour. So, um, you know, I actually have had that on and, and uh, somebody commented about it because it's just so, so different looking. These are my uh, Nixon watches as well. This one's from Boba Fett. And um, this one's really cool. This is a, actually has Boba Fett's coloring on the front of it. And then on the back, if you're a Star Wars nerd, it has him in carbonite up here. You can see that. And then it has Boba Fett's face on the back of the watch too. See that. And um, again, all the Star Wars moniker pieces. And then um, the, actually this watch I got in, I can't pronounce the name of the, of the, of the city, so we'll just put it at the bottom of the screen. Um, I got this on, on our last, one of our last trips. Um, the year before last, obviously, you know, this last year has been interesting. So, um, and then I have my watch here that is called Weird Ape. I got this um, online. This is another newer brand. They actually don't make this brand anymore, this specific model. And actually these straps come off and I can replace them with uh, this rose gold strap or the, um, the burgundy strap as well. So I also have, um, these are called Spinnaker. These watches are called Spinnaker. And um, this is kind of a newer brand that I found online. Uh, this is just a great black, plain black watch. This one I really love because it has the yellow face on it. Again, these are, these are both automatic watches as well. And um, just a great, great fitting watch, you know, a little bit heavier, which is fine for me. This is my Seiko watch that I have. And uh, this is actually called a Hulk. Um, the, it's a Sumo Hulk version um, of Seiko. I actually got this from, had to order it from Japan, which is crazy. And then uh, this is my Omega watch that I have. This is when I mentioned my Planet Ocean Seamaster. And I um, really love this watch. I love the orange bezel on it as well. So this is actually, this watch is about 13 years old and I got it on the second hand market. So all of my watches too, when I buy watches, I always look for deals. Um, I don't just go and you know, spend a maximum amount of money. And like I said, I always have cash for everything. So, and actually my Omega is probably my most expensive watch. It's, you know, and the Omegas run from around 2,500 to, I mean, they get crazy. This one's kind of on the lower end of the scale um, for cost wise. Um, is most expensive. Then I have the Spinnakers are anywhere from like 500 around that to about 250. Um, the, my Weird Ape was about $250. The, these, were, these ones down here are about 150 to $200. Um, some of these were just, were just less expensive that I just like the look of them. So I'm not really like a super expensive guy that way. And then also the, uh, the Flex watches are like in, again, in the $25 range. So they're not super expensive. And um, obviously for Apple Watch and everybody knows how much those cost. So jamashop.com. Crownandcaliber.com is actually where I bought my Omega. I had a Breitling as well that I'd sold back to Crown and Caliber and then saved, I had money saved. It was my birthday, actually my birthday watch this year. And then um, I had some other money saved, so I purchased that. And then also eBay.com has a fine watch verification section. So if you wanna buy a watch off eBay, don't just go to Johnny Dumbum selling his watch, but there's actually a verification on there that'll actually let you know and tell you um, if this watch is verified. So collecting watches doesn't need to be an expensive hobby, but it can be. And our fashion culture right now has definitely moved away from men wearing watches because of being able to have a cell phone that can do the exact same thing. But I like to have multiple watches to accessorize what I wear on a daily basis. And some of the practical things like my Apple Watch, um, some that can be harder like a Nixon Regulus that I really beat up and just take out hiking. Um, one like my Omega that I can have for years and that will be a great, accurate and excellent looking timepiece. And any watch that you take care of really can be a great heirloom piece that you can be handed down to family or friends. So hopefully this gets you thinking about possibly starting your own collection. If you have a watch you enjoy, I would love to see it. Go to Instagram and tag atman360.tv so I can see some of your collection.
So we are actually today in Aaron's backyard. This is uh, the other blade boot camp for him for Gideon's Tactical. And uh, I wanted him to talk a little bit today about backpacks and choosing the right backpack for your everyday need outdoors. So jumping right into uh, the idea of using a backpack in the outdoors. And this could be for anything from mountain biking to snowshoeing, uh, maybe a snowboard or ski, uh, day treks, uh, you know, whatever it may be that you're doing. Um, the things that I just wanna share with you real briefly, I believe will help you make a wise decision so you're not throwing down money on a pack that you're like, whoa, this isn't doing what I want or it's right. really uncomfortable or it's not carrying the load that I thought I needed, those type of things. So just kind of jump right in. We're gonna start real simple, real easy. So this is a structureless pack that we have here. It's about, I think a 20 inch torso. So it almost fits me just right. Uh, and for my needs, for what it's designed for, it works just fine, uh, but it's structureless. There's nothing in there. I could roll it up, stuff it in. So it's not really designed to carry heavy loads. It's mm -hmm. designed to be really um, lightweight that you could maybe put in a larger pack if you're backpacking or you know maybe in your luggage if you're flying somewhere and then you know you're going to do a couple little hikes or something like that. So it's designed you know for very minimal things. Uh, the next thing is this is probably what like 80% of people that do outdoor activities are going to go with. The back has a foam or polymer depending on the design and the, the brand structure to it. So it's still flexible somewhat but there's a lot more rigidness to it. It will just be able to carry a heavier load a lot better. Usually these are built a little bit stronger. They're going to be a little bit heavier overall in general but they have a little bit more organization usually as well like a little stuff pocket, a water bladder sleeve, maybe some other little organizational things that you're going to find in a lot of these type of packs. And now we're starting to get into like the really heavy duty technical um, style of backpack. These are going to have really heavy duty um, yokes. These are going to have uh, a frame in them of some kind, usually uh, either a very rigid polymer, like actual tubed frame or aluminum. This one has an aluminum uh, frame in it. So this is something that you're going to use if you are carrying a lot of weight, I would say over 20 pounds, you know, that you're going to regularly be carrying, you think. Um, this would be great for like dads and you're the one stuck carrying the whole family's equipment on a hike. <laughs> I'm a dad you feel and that I, get, way? I okay. get stuck doing that. So it's like, okay, I'm going to be carrying my wife's stuff, my kid's stuff and my stuff. It's better to go right. with something like this. Aaron, thank you. Absolutely. Uh, for Thanks me for having out me. With backpacking and uh, just helping you with your backpacking choices and needs. Let's do our 360 degree review of today's program. Matt's testimony reminded us to not give up in life and to make sure that we are putting God first in everything we do and not waiting until something catastrophic happens to realign our spiritual priorities in life. I love how he shared who he was before and now after the accident and the perspective he lives with to make sure that he's not just a weekend warrior Christian. You can see his full documentary on our additional content page of man360.tv. Collecting watches is fun as with any hobby we choose in life. The key is to make sure that our hobbies are not weighing us down financially with debt and that we keep our collections in perspective and not let it become something gluttonous or skewing our priorities as men. Aaron gave us some great advice about choosing the right backpack for the right outdoor activity. Our full conversation had even more great information, so we provided a link to the entire segment on our website. You can always send us a prayer request and tell us what you think of the program on our website and feel free to connect with us on Facebook and Instagram and we'll see you next week right here on Man360.